Hello and welcome to another episode of Mike and Dave's Hi-Fi Riff. I'm Mike Evans. And I'm David Price. And David, on this week's riff, what are we going to talk about? This, Mike. Look at this. Yeah. I, I can't begin to I love our cassette deck riffs. Yeah. I really do. They're so yeah. pure nostalgia for me. Yeah. Real trip down memory lane. Um, it's funny, isn't it? Because all the other hi-fi which we, which we review, amplifiers still use today yeah. uh, CD players we still use today turntables we still use all of our retro stuff speakers we still use today but cassette decks far less and less don't Speak we Which I think, yourself well I think it's a terrible <laughs> shame I know you do and I know you love them and you still I've make I've driven of... here in a car with a cassette deck yeah you have actually yes this is your new <laughs> Volvo isn't it which yes. We've, yes which we've which we have uh, discussed on previous riffs. So, well, yes. Yeah, well, depends, so. I suppose it depends which order the riffs come out on, and I'm not yes. going to go into your Volvo again. We'll so. tell the Volvo story in another we will. Uh, yes. riff. But basically, my Volvo has got a three-CD changer in the dashboard and a cassette uh, player as well. How's that for being cool? Very nice, very nice. Yes. My, um, my Lexus of Love yeah. has got a cassette player and a CD multi-changer. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, there you go. Yeah. So I still put the odd cassette in. Yeah. In fact, I bought an Akamichi from you recently. Yes. And um, which we did on a riff. Yeah. Uh, and I've got some some stuff which I've recorded playing in my Lexus of Love as we speak. There you so, go. There we go. So yeah. yeah. So there's still a place for it. So but you only were if wrong. you've got <laughs> only if you've got really old cars like we yeah. have. Okay. So yeah. Um, probably you know modern yeah. day with Android Auto and Apple yeah. AirPlay Apple and all this stuff. CarPlay. Yeah. yeah. It's not. It's, it's sort of not quite happening. Yeah. But I'm disappointed. That was the yes. point I'm making because I still think cassette decks are one of the most gorgeous things they are things and of loveliness they really they? are yeah. yes and and i remember i think my uh, my sort of love of them probably came and i dare say the same place as you because um it was from recording the illegally recording the yes. charts uh, on a sunday night you know so, the, the top 40 with tony blackburn or whoever it might have been so there you go uh, um thames valley police yes so yeah. mike has confessed I'm not going to confess, but Mike's confessed. <laughs> so if you want to, if you want his address, just phone me up, email by the uh, yeah. I'll, website. I'll dob you in too, though. <laughs> so because <laughs> I know you yeah. did it as well. Tony Blackburn is owed some royalties. Yes, yeah, or quite, something like that. Was it Simon Bates? I can't remember. I think well, well yeah. certainly sort of the, yeah. the early days when we first had our first Philips cassette deck. It was it was yeah probably Tony Blackburn to be fair, pot pickers. Mm. So. Um, but yeah. but it was really lovely because you know you you couldn't well, I certainly couldn't afford to go and buy you know four or five seven inch singles every week yeah um, and it meant that you could actually record the record them and listen again yeah. you know you had to put up with sort of Tony Blackburn uh, yeah. talking between them but you know that was that was fine that was fine yeah agreed mate top of top of most of the popper most and straight in at number three and the other thing of course yeah. was um, actually cassettes were quite expensive yeah so I remember we had two cassettes. We had a yes. C120 and a C60. Yeah. Um, I don't think you could even get... Well, you probably could get C90s, but we didn't. Have, they weren't on our radar at the time. Uh, and so we'd record them onto a sort of, you know, a C120. Yeah. And then, you know, you'd, you'd overwrite the previous week's uh, top 20. Yes. Uh, you know, because they, they were they were valuable. Um, a bit like the BBC did with sort of Doctor Who and stuff yeah. like that. You know. You'd record over Ultravox's Vienna... With Joe Dolce's "Shut Up on Your Face," exactly. Yes, <laughs> yes. And you think you've done the right thing? You're quite right. No, quite Until right. you played it back. We should do a riff yes. on on, on uh, travesties which didn't get to number but number one, held off yes. by dreadful songs. Absolutely, that being a classic example. Yeah. Yes, travesty but, wasn't that a BG song? Uh, it probably was actually. Yeah. No, that's yeah. tragedy. Well, that same thing. <laughs> um, also, yes, we love our Sony cassette decks. We do, don't we? We just love our Sony yeah. cassette decks, and we've both owned Sony cassette decks, we haven't have. we? In the yeah. past, yeah. Um, in fact, I think I bought one from you. Yeah. Back in the day. Yeah. Back in the day. Yeah. Um, a TCFX one twenty. Yeah. Yeah, it's not a not a bad one. No, it was Quite really good. nice actually. Yeah. Yes, really, really nice. Yeah. I was so, it three twenty? I think it was TCFX three twenty, possibly, but okay. Um. Yeah. Okay. So, but um, yeah. Anyway, um. So going back to today's riff, so what I'm presenting to you today, viewers, is I think um, one of the most important Sony cassette decks ever made, um, simply because it was the beginning of the new era of um, cassette decks from, from the aforementioned Japanese giant manufacturer. And this came out in 1980, I think it was. Right. Um, 
No, it was um, maybe autumn 1979. And it was um, the first uh, metal cassette deck, basically. Metal tape compatible, Type 4 compatible cassette deck that Gosh. Sony did. And um, you, we remember when metal came out, because they were very expensive tapes. They were really they? were, and yes, yeah. You know, we'd be like sort of 13 or something and reading adverts for them and thinking like, no way. You yeah, know? yes, <laughs> yeah. So I expected them to yeah. be really heavy, heavy as well, yeah. you know, sort of, sort of like full of lead or something. Exactly. So, so you had, you know, a TDK D90 would be about, you know, a pound or something yes. from wherever you got it, WH Smith, and the metal tapes were like eight or nine pounds. Yes, so yeah. They were way past our, uh, you they, know. They, yeah. they really were. So, um, Do you remember the first one you bought? Uh, I, I seem to remember you yes. having a metal thing, yeah. uh, and I can sort of picture it because it had like really cool spools in yeah. the middle. Um, M A M A X M A R, I think it was M A R T D K M A R. Was it? Yep. Was that what it was? Yep. Amazing. And but I remember sort of you know uh, companies like B A S F yes. making them, yep. and you know there were a few, weren't there, which sort of came. Sony, out. yeah, did uh, yeah, Sony Metal and um, Scotch Metafine and all those kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, fantastic. Metal. Fantastic. Yeah, all just way above our sort of pay grade. Do you think it, they made a massive difference um, over the FECRs? Yeah, I think I think they did a bit. I think they made a. I think they were. Uh, I think they were more of an, an improvement than than ferrochromes, you know, because ferro ferrochromes were the sort of first generation of super tapes, weren't they? Yes. And they kind of came out about nineteen seventy six, I think, and they were supposed to have the the um, sort of uh, definition of a chrome, but but you know the kind of lower bias or whatever of a ferric can basically deliver a very good uh, overall sound. Um, that was like a combination, of the best of two worlds, um, and they they were good, I think, but they were expensive. But metals really, the big thing about metals was you could record them at high levels, couldn't you? you could really put. High high levels in plus yes five, plus five plus six supposed to have a, like, a really good dynamic range yeah. wasn't it in yeah. all of these things and yes. they did sound they did sound more dynamic I think yes and you can whack up the levels um, but the um, the interesting thing about this cassette deck is that um, because of the way it's been designed even with um, TDK D you can still record it quite at quite high levels it's got very good heads and and record electronics. And you can you can calibrate the tape, um, the sensitivity of the tape and the bias, so it's absolutely perfect. And it's got built-in calibration, which is uh, down here. And you can basically switch on the the calibration system, yes, which is this thing here, and it will generate a test tone. Yes, brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then yeah. you then twiddle these knobs up here, yeah, to um, to change the bias and the the record calibration on left and right channels. So, Brilliant. So basically you can calibrate perfectly. Yes. Um, even a cheap TDKD, get the absolute best out of it. And then record it in quite high, you know, like plus four, plus five, that kind of level. Um, whereas um, most cassette decks wouldn't wouldn't do that. Um, so that Sony had very good calibration, a very good calibration system. It had metal tape compatibility, which is the type four there. Um, it had sand dust and ferrite heads, uh, which I don't know if we can. I'll just see. I'll just pull this thing off. No, look at you. I don't know if we can see that. If the camera can see those heads at all, but there you go. Um, and these were really super, super strong, super tough. Wow. Uh, and um, the uh, you know many heads fitted to cassette decks of this era were permalloy and oh uh, yeah, of course, yeah, softer, yeah. Me yes. softer metal, yeah. and it wore out basically. Whereas the sand dust and ferrites didn't wear out, and they also were able to handle the high levels that metal tape put into the. And is this uh, is this still still all original? It is. Yeah. Yeah. That's so brilliant. It's, um, uh, it's still going strong. It's still going strong. As a, as a testimony to exactly what you're yeah. talking about. Um, so absolutely. what would this have, what would this have set me back in seventy nine? Yeah. So 80. this was roughly the same price as a Lin LP twelve. No way. Yeah. My gosh. Seriously. So, yeah. Wow. So. Wow. Um, it would have been um, more expensive than that crappy open reel tape deck you've got. Oi! Don't stop dissing me, me <laughs> so, Akai. 
And I also, uh, <laughs> don't stop, stop. Long which, day. Which which one would you no, like I'm me not to stop? Don't, don't. This okay. Um, yeah. So uh, while Mike remembers what brand his S- open stop reel is, stop it. <laughs> My lovely four thousand so, DB. He's um, yeah, doubly. Yeah, he's doubly. Well, this has got doubly as well, obviously. Um, and um, but it's 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 got um. Uh, it's basically it was the, a sort of high end cassette deck that would w- get the best out of any tape, and it was uh, more expensive than a, than a basic Nakamichi, but it was not as expensive as the sort of higher end Nakamichi. Right, got you. Substantially cheaper than that. Yeah. Um, but it kind of, in terms of measure performance, got pretty close to those really quite expensive Nakamichis, which are like 500 quid. Yeah, sure. Uh, whereas sure. this was only 349 and probably 300 if you got it from, you know, Lasky's or yes, from yeah. a sale or something. Sure. Um, so, yeah, um, and it had um, dual capstan as well um, and uh, low wow and flutter. I think the wow and flutter is 0.04%, which is very low for uh, for cassette and much lower than your open reel tape deck, Mike. And... Um, 20 hertz, 20 kilohertz with metal tape um, in terms of frequency response, which is very good. Sadly, not as wide as your open reel. There we uh, are. Kai. No. Um, going at uh, seven and a half inches per second. Um, yeah, and even with crappy TDKD, um, it was still 20 hertz to 16 kilohertz, which was good enough, I think, for... Tony Blackburn. Tony Blackburn, easily, yes. yes. Easily good enough. And... Um, you know, but you could. Uh, this sounds surprisingly good with even with cheap tape. That's so excellent, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, that's so cool. I love the way you can sort of adjust everything, yeah. get all the bias correct, and yeah. all of these things. Um, but it's like it still makes sort of perfect mixtapes, doesn't it? Um, I mean, well, speaking of which, you owe me a mixtape. Have you forgotten? Uh, I had forgotten. Yes. Okay. Okay. Just a gentle <laughs> reminder. Live Thank on live on Sky. You've uh, you've been reminded. Thank you so, for reminding me. You're welcome. You're yes. welcome. There's a bit of previous here because I bought this Nakamichi from David uh, with the proviso that I would get a, a mixtape thrown in. Um, and I haven't had a mixtape from you in a long time. But David used to send me mixtapes all recorded on yeah. beautiful machinery such as this yeah. um, of some really sort of classic tunes from the 70s and 80s. Yeah. So I was, I'm was i looking forward to my mixtape. Okay. So The, the hint has been dropped. Very now, good. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. So... Yeah. Um, sort of by modern standards so by that what I mean is sort of the tape decks which yeah. came like say 10 years later yeah. um, how would this have stacked up? That's a great question so um, if you think very very uh, broadly you had kind of three eras of cassette you had um, obviously the format came out in 63 but really people weren't using cassette for hi-fi use until the early 70s and even then very very niche you know? yes yeah but basically you had 70s cassettes 70s cassette decks you had 80s cassette decks and you had 90s cassette decks and then by the 2000s they'd really just gone off gone away and you yeah, know yeah mini disc was the latest thing or mp3 yes um so um this is this came out in late very end of uh, 79 early 1980 and this was pretty much way better i think than any 1970s cassette deck and yes okay, that's why okay, this okay at the time when this came out it seemed such a big deal you yeah know, in terms of measure performance in terms of its ability to set set um, up to the tape and everything it was just like wow this is the future so here's my sort of very yeah. loaded question yeah. then so given given that so the, say that's 1980 yeah by 1990 yeah how much money did you have to spend to get yeah. an equivalent sounding cassette deck yeah, well, you'd be um, so in the early '90s. Sony re- uh, released the uh, TC uh, K six one one S, which was had a powered draw mechanism, and it had individual calibration and and uh, dual capstan three head, and that was gonna that was around two hundred and fifty quid in nineteen ninety ish, like early '90s, whereas this was more expensive than that 10 years earlier so basically all the features that you got in this amazing wow super machine of the late 70s early 80s uh, for 349 um, you could now get for 
you know, if you can account for inflation for roughly half the price. Yes, yeah, sure. And add sure. a fancy power draw loader as well. Yes, okay. Um, okay. Yeah. It was and, a very loaded question, by yeah, the way. And that would that would have kind of come come close. Because I've got a special guest here oh, with me. Wow. I've got I've got my special guest which I want to share with you. Wow. Okay, which I've hidden. You don't know what this is, do I you? Don't, no, no, no. So this is drum roll, please. Yep. This is my Ooh. look at this boxed oh, wow. Sony TCFX120 that you sold me. Oh my god! Look at that. So it was a 120. Yeah, look at that. Isn't that just fabulous? God. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Still got it. Now I'm trying That's to work amazing. out how long ago that would have been. Yeah. Um, but it was you know off a, a while ago. Definitely and, mid 80s. And kind of my million dollar question is you know how would it stack up compared oh, wow. to um, compared to today's model? Like, yeah. Yes. That's fabulous. Still got all its original packaging and all sorts of weird and wonderful things. Oh, Look wow. at that. Does that bring back memories? No. <laughs> <laughs> there we are. Mike, you've ruined yeah. it. It's for, it's got all fingerprints all over it. Well, I was I haven't had it out of the box in okay. fifteen years. All so, right. and I've just sort of dug it out today to give it a okay. bit of a yeah. Yeah, oh, look well, at that. Isn't that nice. fab? Isn't yeah. that fab? There we are. It is there fab. We are. A bit yeah. of a party piece there. Anyway, nowhere near as good as this. <laughs> <laughs> Even though you've just admitted Forget about it is. Get a little load of old rubbish. Even though you just said that it was. No, I didn't. Yes, you did. No, I didn't. And it's on film. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So, but um, ignoring Mike's uh, um, yeah, irrelevant diversion for a moment. Um, so this this was kind of giving this kind of was I think as good as anything up to the early mid 90s um, with the exception of the really top Nakamichi's and stuff yeah um, and so it was way ahead of its time and even now sounds really good you know on its own terms uh, if it's properly set up and it's not knackered um, and really um, it, it, it was important for kind of pushing the whole you know kind of cassette deck movement forward I think um, out of the 70s which was you know when cassette was not generally very good into the 80s when it was really beginning to get get good i think so, excellent so it's a proper piece of hi-fi history yeah it's a, and the great thing is and this is why we're covering it today is there's loads of them around and they're still pretty cheap there you go so and they've got the, yeah. the super duper heads which last for ages they have yeah so they should be should yeah. be pretty bulletproof yeah. so yeah excellent so the worst thing that can really happen to it is is it needs a bit of a an internal grease and some, uh, you know, new uh, belts. I think it's don't gonna, we all? It's gonna, yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. So it's got a, um, uh, it's got a Sony um, uh, BSL motor, um, which drives the flywheel via, um, via a little rubber belt, and that can go. Um, but um, you know, a generally very uh, reliable deck, actually. So, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Really smart. Really nice. I love them. I think they look gorgeous, um, and they're still very much part of my sort of hi-fi heritage. Yeah. So I'm, I'm always pleased to see a cassette deck, and I'm really glad you brought it in. That's excellent. Yeah. Um, it's just a bit of a shame we don't yeah. have a recording of the Tony Blackburn Top Forty we could listen to as well. It, it really is. Brilliant. Yes. Yes. So um, I, I've probably got quite a few actually, but I just didn't think to bring them in. Today. It would have been so if it's if it's sort of uh, late '79, early 1980. Yeah. Then the number one song at the time would have been another Brick in the Wall Part Two by Pink uh, Floyd. Yeah. There you are. See, fantastic. So, yes, which would have been really quite cool to listen to. But she, the which the recording quality of that album would have probably yeah. fit in really rather nicely with your Sony here. Yeah. So no, brilliant, okay. brilliant. I'm not going to ask you to do a um, a, a riffometer on it. Okay. Because, um, because I haven't listened to it. Uh, full disclosure. Yeah. Um, but I will, I will, and yeah. we'll have a we'll have a blast in it. Yeah. But I love the I love yeah. the idea behind it, which I think is absolutely fab. So thanks so much for yeah. bringing that. Well, it's Excellent. um it's a good sounding deck. Um, it's not the very best, but it's no. way better than most. Yeah, it's not as good as my TCFX. Sadly, nothing from... ever will be. <laughs> <laughs> so. And on that bombshell. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Mike and Dave Sci-Fi Riff, and we'll very much look forward to seeing you at the next one. Thanks a million. Bye-bye.